Okay, so we're recording now. Make sure I'm not missing anybody. Okay, so everybody's on. Okay, so you know, one, I obviously I apologize for uh, for last week. I didn't plan on working, but uh, one of the paramedics um, got sick. He actually had a pulmonary embolism, and uh, he still oh, they switched him from. Um, they switched him from Good Sam. Well, actually, he had a pulmonary embolism diagnosed in his doctor's office. The doctor told him, I'll put you on Eliquist and send you home. The guy called me up, and I'm like, that makes no sense. You know, I said, you should probably, you know, find a different doctor. But anyway, he followed that doctor, went home on Eliquist, and that was – so that would have been – we were trying to teach on Thursday. So on Friday, home one day on Eliquist. He was down in his basement uh, watching TV, wanted to go to sleep. So he walked up two flights of stairs to, uh, to go to sleep, and he was totally winded, and he felt like he was going to pass out. So he called the ambulance. That was the exact time that the, um, the rattlesnake bite – I don't know if you know, we had a pretty legitimate rattlesnake bite up in Slotown. Oh, yeah, I heard that. They're, actually, the girl did phenomenal. They thought she was going to lose her leg. It was a very, another very interesting call. They had to call N NYPD. They have a helicopter that actually has a hoist that they could lower, they lowered, we had paramedics up on top of the cliff with the lady. They actually lowered uh, the hoist with a Stokes basket and two police paramedics down, Whoa. Ho hoisted her up. And then because of politics, uh, Nyack wanted the patient to go there, even though there was no reason in the world for it to go there. Yes. But the, uh, they landed at Nyack and two hours later, Nyack's like, oh my God, she's a train wreck. Let's, you know, <laughs> send her to Kobe. So then she <laughs> went by ground. So she's got a Twelve to fifteen thousand dollar helicopter. Well, actually, I don't know if the city police actually charge for it. They probably don't. But if it the city been, doesn't bill, yeah, if it had been stat flight, they would have charged for it, and uh, whatever. So, but it was interesting. But anyway, this guy with the pulmonary embolism calls for an ambulance in the midst of all of this, and the two ambulances that would have responded were, you know, over there. So they wound up having to get a different ambulance to come and whatever. So he went to Good Sam. They did a, uh, a VQ scan and a CAT scan, and he wound up having numerous pulmonary embolisms. And also, he had a deep vein thrombosis in his leg. And uh, you know, then they said, oh, you know, you got to stay, which is you really should stay. And they put on a heparin infusion, but um, they can't find the source. Like usually when people get pulmonary embolisms, it's because they're bedridden or you know, they have a cast on or something like that. This guy's active. He's older, but he's active. So they think he has abnormal clotting factors, and he's just throwing off clots because of that. One of the other reasons could be is that you know you have a problem with your valves in your heart, you're not opening and closing right, and you tend to clot up in the heart and then shower them out. So it was uh, whatever. It was just an interesting, interesting week all around for uh, for, for, for uh, interesting calls and stuff. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we'll review a couple of the cardiac conditions. We'll talk about the medications that we uh, use to treat them, and then after that we'll go over the. Uh, Quiz. Make sure I covered everything, and then you know I'll I'll send out the quiz. Um, I don't have everybody's. I'm going to mute everybody because it's getting a little noisy. But um, we um we I don't have everybody's email address, so I see there's some people I might not have. So if you don't get it, then just uh, send a text or an email to Pete or to Wayne or somebody you know has access to the the mailing list for the ambulance corps, and they'll they'll send it out to you. Um, you know they'll send it out or we send it out and stuff like that to everybody. Okay, so if anybody has a question as I'm going through it, then just unmute yourself and um, you know ask your question. Don't do that uh, raise your hand thing because sometimes I don't see that. So if you truly have a question, by all means, unmute yourself. Okay, so there's obviously many, many, many reasons why people could have chest pain. Tonight we're going to talk about the main cardiac-related reasons why people could have chest pain. So the two main ones we pace, face are angina and acute myocardial infarction. So angina pectoris, right, is the real name. So it's pain in the chest. Um, hold on one second. I got a lot of background noise here. So, uh, okay. And then the other one, obviously, the heart attack, the acute myocardial infarction. So but the probable cause of both of them is like the same etiology which is most of us based on our diet, okay, we eat a lot of fatty foods. And because of that, we get what's called plaque deposits in our coronary arteries. And the body knows, and again, this is a chronic progressive type of thing. And for most people, the danger is only in their, say, 50s and 60s and 70s. Some people earlier, but for the most time, um, you know, later in life. But um, 
you know, in angina, there's two situations. So they have these fat deposits in the inside of their arteries, which obviously narrow the lumen or the tube where the blood is going through. The other thing that happens in, in angina is that calcium infiltrates the walls of the arteries. And we know that arteries have the ability to dilate and constrict, depending on where you need blood to go. So we're talking the coronary arteries, right, that service the heart itself. These are the arteries that are on the surface of the surface of the heart, and they, they service the heart itself um, with the blood it needs. And they're small, right? I mean, this is when they do you know, bypass surgery and everything like that. So it's easy to, uh, to clot them off, right? It's not the most difficult thing in the world to, to clot them off. So because of the fat deposits, not as much blood goes through them, okay? And because of the calcium, they can't dilate. So what happens is that angina patient has some type of stressful situation occur. They're walking upstairs, they got into an argument, you know, they're having sex or something like that. And because of that, their heart needs more oxygenated blood because it's a muscle, right? And to be able to work, it needs oxygen and sugar, just like any muscle. It needs to have aerobic metabolism. And now because of that narrowing of the blood vessels and the stiffening of the blood vessels, um, it can't get enough blood. So the muscle reverts from anaerobic metabolism, I'm sorry, from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. And the byproduct of anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid. So you've all felt lactic acid in your muscle, it hurt, it burned. And that's the chest pain that people feel uh, when they're having a heart, heart attack or angina is the lactic acid that's in the heart muscle because of the lack of oxygen. Now angina, it's a temporary situation, right? In other words, they had what they call a mismatch. They had a mismatch between the amount of oxygen their heart needed at any one time and the amount of oxygen it was able to get because of the condition of angina. So they're walking up the stairs, they need more oxygen, they can't get it, they get chest pain. Most people would then sit down and they immediately start to reverse their symptoms now because as soon as you sit down and relax, you need less oxygen going to your heart. Sometimes it doesn't work instantaneously because they're scared, right? Oh my God, I'm having crushing chest pain. I might be having a heart attack and they get scared, okay? And it doesn't go away because of the fact that when you're scared, you secrete adrenaline into your bloodstream and that makes your heart work harder. So, but if everything goes according to plan, you know, this patient would sit down and relax. The police would show up, we would show up, we put them on some oxygen and the pain should gradually go away. So now they have this situation, we take them to the hospital the next day they get a stress test, the, the pain is reproduced on a stress test, and the doctor says, okay, you know, we're gonna do a cardiac catheterization. They go look in the arteries, nothing's completely blocked, but they see narrowing, and they say, okay, you have angina, and you know, we're gonna prescribe uh, a medication called nitroglycerin, and if you ever have this again, you need to stop what you're doing and take one tablet or one spray, put it under your tongue, wait five minutes. If it doesn't go away, take another one. Wait another five minutes. If it doesn't go away, take a third one. If it still continues after three tablets, then you need to call the ambulance. Okay. You may be having a heart attack. So of course that is in the back of their mind, right? So now they have their second episode of, of angina and they either forgot their nitro at home or they took their nitro and you know, they're not getting any immediate relief and they get scared and they call the ambulance and then we show up. And usually with some psychological first aid, calming them down, putting them on oxygen, making them comfortable, the pain slowly starts to diminish, right? And it, it goes away. That is not typical of the heart attack patient. Once the heart attack occurs, that patient has pain until they get angioplasty, right? So until that artery is opened up because there's a different pathophysiology of what's going on here. So in angina, it's just a temporary mismatch. There's no complete blockage of an artery, you know, between the amount of oxygen the heart needs and the amount of um, oxygen it's getting. Now that's your garden variety angina. There's other types of angina, you know, there's Prinz metal angina, which is more of a spasming of the artery. So that could hit somebody without any exertion. Uh, but people, again, you know, once, they, once they've had it and they get that diagnosis, you know, they know about it and they could say to you, I have angina, but it's a different one. It's, we treat it the same way, but you may get confused because you're gonna say to them, you know, what were you doing at the time that your chest pain started? And they're gonna say, I was sitting down. So right away, you should say, okay, that sounds more like a heart attack because most heart attacks actually happen at rest. But it could be that Prinz metal angina. Then there's also unstable angina, which is they have angina. And usually it took, uh, you know, they had to walk 20 blocks before they got chest pain. Now they start telling you that over the last couple of months, it was happening earlier and earlier, where they usually had to walk up three flights of stairs before they had pain. And now it's, you know, one flight of stairs. That's considered a real precursor um, to having a heart attack. So like, you know, like a TIA is a real risk factor of having a true stroke uh, um, and stable, unstable angina where the pain is happening more frequently with less exertion is considered to be a real precursor to somebody actually having a full heart attack. Now, most patients have angina, like I said, it's episodic, it happens, it goes away. 
um, there's no long-term you know, effect to them. So a lot of times in the house, we may relieve their chest pain and they're gonna say, I don't need to go to the hospital. And they're probably right, but unfortunately, you know, we can't be 100% certain about having a heart attack. So we have to tell them that you know, we would recommend that they go to the hospital. And you know, if they're totally refusing, it would be what we call a medical control RMA. So you'd have to call medical control and say, this is what we have. We're trying to get him to go to the hospital. He doesn't want to go. Can you talk to him? And you know, medical control will talk to the patient and say, we really think you should come here. And if the patient still says no, then you just document that on your PCR. And you actually accomplished your, you know, your job, which is you put the patient in contact with a doctor. Again, it wasn't face to face because the guy didn't want to go, but you did what you were supposed to do, which is you got the patient into the healthcare network and they refused. And obviously you always want to document on a refusal like this that, you know, besides contacting medical control, that you pointed out the risks to the patient, right? That he could, you know, be having a heart attack, um, that you told the patient that they could call you back if they changed their mind at any point. And the last thing I always try to write is that the patient was left conscious, alert, and oriented in the care of. Now, so if, obviously if they're home alone, there is nobody, okay, but in the care of someone. So you're basically documenting that you did everything you could, you tried to convince them, you got them in touch with a doctor, you pointed out the risks, they're still refusing, and you made sure you left somebody with them so that if they need help, there's somebody they could call for help if they're incapacitated. Okay, now, what do we do for a patient who has angina? So again, psychological first aid definitely comes into play, right? We'd want to um, you know, do the best that we could do to um, relax them, make them comfortable and stuff like that. And the other thing that would come into play would be to put them on high concentration oxygen. Now there's a little controversy you know, about what we always know is if, they, if, they're, if their pulse ox is normal, right? Which you know, most people define as 94% or higher, is there really a need for a lot of supplemental oxygen, right? That's a little controversy and stuff like that. Our protocol says oxygen is appropriate. So that means, you know, if they're satting at 94%, probably putting them on a non-rebreather is not indicated. But from a medical legal standpoint, I would probably still put them on a liter or two of nasal oxygen. Because again, if something goes wrong, this patient dies and some lawyer reviews the chart and you know, he says, well, a patient having a heart attack and he never got oxygen, there might be a window of opportunity you know, there. So if you have them on oxygen, they take, you take away that window of opportunity to you know, expose yourself to liability and stuff like that. So I'd still put them on a liter or two of, of oxygen. But the days of the non-rebreathers in patients who are having you know, ischemic chest pain are kind of going out. And people argue, you know, well, the reason they're having that ischemic chest pain you just told me is that they're not getting enough oxygen to their heart. And, and that is the reason. But what they found is that people who have super high oxygen levels, right, really crazy high pulse oxygen of 100 and higher, they actually wind up having worse outcomes than people who have normal oxygen saturations. And that kind of makes sense because we know that, you know, we were made to have certain numbers of everything in our body. And if we exceed it, it's equally as dangerous if we're too low of those numbers. So if our oxygen's too low, it's dangerous. But also if our oxygen's too high, the body's not designed to exist in that, you know, environment and there's going to be side effects. So, you know, you really probably would not be putting non rebreathers Now, if you had a patient with, you know, crushing chest pain and the row two sat on room air is, you know, 90% or 88%, but then by all means, you could start them on a nasal cannula, probably more like four liters. If that brings their oxygen level up to 94%, you could stop at that. But if you can't get their oxygen level above 94% um, with nasal oxygen, then you would have to switch to a non rebreather Okay, so any questions on the um, angina patient? So I'm sure everybody's had a patient, you know, who's had angina. It's, I mean, less and less a common condition because people live a little healthier and stuff like that. But, you know, there's definitely patients out there. Some patients have such chronic angina that instead of just having the tablets or the spray when they have an emergency, they actually have a nitroglycerin patch on their skin. So it's giving them some nitroglycerin all the time. And then there's nitroglycerin by pill you know, that people could take, but it's not actually called. It's like isorbid. It's like a, the nitro we give them on their tongue is rapid acting when they're actually having a problem. Some of these other nitrate types of medications are long acting, like delayed release, so that instead of having a patch on their body, they take a pill and it gives them a little bit of nitrate throughout the day to try to keep those blood vessels dilated, right? So we'll talk about, uh, you know, contraindications and stuff like that to nitroglycerin and, you know, when we, uh, when we go through the medications. Um, the acute myocardial infarction is a completely different beast. So the, the etiology, right, is probably somewhat similar to start with, or the pathophysiology is 
pretty similar to start with, which is, again, because of our poor diet, okay, we have fat deposits in our arteries. Now, anytime you have something in your body that doesn't belong there, the body always grows a cap over it, kind of hides it. So you, you develop what's called a fibrous cap over this fat, okay? And the, the safer you are is the, the thicker the cap is because if the cap ruptures, which is what typically causes a heart attack, uh, the cap ruptures, the body think that's, thinks that's a wound on the inside of the artery and it sends platelets to cover it, just like if you had a wound on your skin, right? Platelets cause the clot. So and what happens now is those platelets stick very efficiently inside your artery and they close it off in a period of, you know, 30 minutes to an hour or two, they close it off. So, you know, that's, the, so that's why it's not a short term thing, right? It's until that artery is reopened, that part of the heart is going to be deprived of oxygen. And your survival is based on what part of the heart is deprived of oxygen, right? If it's your lower parts of your heart, your ventricles, you're going to have a pretty bad outcome. If it's your upper parts, your atriums that don't do a lot of pumping, then you might have a better outcome. Now, a couple of interesting things about the acute myocardial infarction. Most of the patients, like I said, are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, right? When 80s, you know, when they develop it. But you've all heard of the young patient, 20s, 30s, 40s, who has a heart attack and has a bad outcome, right? Doesn't, doesn't do as well as the, and you've also heard of the, you know, you have grandparents where they say to you, oh, the doctor said I had three, three heart attacks that I didn't even know about, never even had chest pain, right? So why is it that the younger patient that has a heart attack has a worse outcome a lot of times than the um, older patient? So remember I said this takes a long time, decades to develop. So what happens is the body senses that certain parts of the heart muscle are not getting enough oxygenated blood because they're getting clogged up. So it doesn't say, okay, Frank, you, you know, ate, you ate like crap for years. So, you know, at some point you're going to die of heart attack. What it actually does is grows additional blood vessels in that area where it senses there's not enough blood flow. So it grows branches of coronary arteries in that area. And it's called, the term for it is called collateral, like when you have collateral on a loan, collateral circulation. So now when that 80 year old has a heart attack and they close off a specific artery, they have other arteries that have grown over the years in the same area. So yes, they're not getting 100% of the blood flow they should be getting, but they're getting a lot of it. So they don't have the same severity. The 30 year old that has a heart attack, okay, they don't have that collateral circulation. So when they knock off that artery and seal it off and close it, there's nothing else giving blood to that area and they tend to have a worse outcome. So long and short is eat healthy, and if you have to have a heart attack, wait till you're older to actually have it, right? Then when you're uh, when you're younger. Um, now, a couple other interesting things about acute myocardial infarction: it's usually not brought on by stress. It's not brought on by exercise. It's not brought on by physical exertion. Okay, um, it can be, but the most common presentation of a heart attack patient is that they were at rest or just woke up, and you you see that yourself, you know, on calls you go to. Most people will say. When you say to them, what were you doing when the pain came on? They'll say, I was sitting here watching TV, you know, or something like that. Where the angina patient is going to say, I was walking upstairs. I was exerting myself. I was doing something. And the reason why is that they feel that the reason why the cap over the fat ruptures is because of um, what they call inflammatory processes. So it's kind of going back to COVID because COVID they're finding now is more of a inflammatory problem than an infectious problem. So when you have um, this massive inflammatory process, you secrete these substances called the cytokines. Cytokines. Um, these are inflammatory substances that are secreted. Okay. When cytokine hits the artery, uh, I'm sorry, hits the cap over the um, fat in the artery, it weakens the wall of the, the cap. Now the purpose of the cap is to keep the, everything in place. So when it weakens the wall and the wall ruptures, the body thinks there's a cut on the inside of the artery. Okay, there's not, but it thinks there's a cut. Okay, there's a wound. And anytime the body thinks there's a wound, it sends platelets and fibrin, just like you when you have a scab on your arm, to cover it up, to seal it off and stuff like that. The problem is that inside the coronary artery, it quickly does what? Shuts off the blood flow, and that's your acute myocardial infarction, right? Once it shuts off the blood flow, the heart muscle is deprived of oxygen. It becomes ischemic first. That's the first stage where it's, the muscle is still salvageable. Okay, and then if the heart muscle dies because of lack of oxygen, it's called infarction. So our job really is to get them to the hospital before they infarct, okay, and, you know, before their heart muscle is, is damaged so that it could be reperfused and hopefully they don't have any long-term damage because if the muscle infarcts, then you now have scar tissue, 
you know, on your heart muscle. And that means that area that's scarred does not open, you know, uh, constrict and dilate the way it should. So the person's going to have some type of lasting damage. Again, it depends on how much damage and what part of the heart it's, uh, it's doing it. In. Now, we know for angina, we said that we could help somebody with some oxygen. And if they have their own nitroglycerin, we can assist them in taking their own nitroglycerin. In the acute myocardial infarction, we have a, one added thing we could do, okay, which is we could put them on oxygen if their pulse ox is below 94%, but we can also give them baby aspirin, right? Non enterically coated baby aspirin, because what does aspirin do to help them? Aspirin interferes with the ability for the platelets to clump together. It's called platelet aggregation. So when a platelet hits something, it stops, and then another one goes on, and another one, another one, another one, and it makes a scab. So when you give them aspirin, you interfere with that platelet aggregation and you buy them time, right, to get into the angioplasty suite before their artery is completely closed off. So in fact, if you had chest pain, right, and you popped your aspirin, you may not actually have any closure of an artery. You may prevent it. The problem is that most people don't know what it is. They don't have aspirin. And when they have a heart attack, they're denial at first, right? And they wait 15, 20, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. And by then there's already clogging going on, okay? Before you know, they call us and then we take another 10, 15, 20 minutes before we get the aspirin on board, the time we respond and assess them and everything like that. So, you know, the quicker somebody takes an aspirin, the better it is for them if they're having a heart attack. Now, if you gave an angina patient an aspirin, doesn't matter. It's not gonna hurt them. It's not gonna help them, but it's not gonna hurt them. Okay, so if you couldn't tell the difference between angina and acute myocardial infarction, you're actually 100% appropriate in giving them aspirin. Okay, or even if you said, you know what, I can't be 100% certain. You know, what I mean, on a, on a BLS level, I can't be 100% certain whether it's angina or acute myocardial infarction. Give them the aspirin. There's no problems with it. We'll talk about when we talk about aspirin, one or two risk factors, not risk factors, but one or two contraindications when you wouldn't give it. But, you know, other than those contraindications, there's no reason why you wouldn't give somebody who's having chest discomfort aspirin. Okay. In fact, when I got to the hospital, the first thing they asked me on that VTAC question uh, was, uh, VTAC patient was, did I give him aspirin? I said, well, he's never had any chest pain. Why would I give him aspirin? They said, oh, you should just give it to him anyway. And I said, okay. I said, I don't know why, but you know, he never complained of chest pain. He complained of lethargy and he had no radial pulse. So I, you know, I didn't suspect that he would be having any, you know, myocardial infarction problems and stuff like that. But, you know, they gave him aspirin. He never infarcted. He never had a problem with that. His problem just was his heart rate, you know, and his abnormal rhythm. Okay, so let's talk about a couple other conditions and then we'll review the medications and everything that we use to treat them. Okay, so congestive heart failure and acute pulmonary edema are kind of one in the same. In my mind, congestive heart failure is a chronic condition that people live day in, day out. And acute pulmonary edema is when they flash over middle of the night and call us and we get there and they can't breathe and they're fighting us and everything like that. But they're really the kind of the same problem. So why does somebody have a situation where fluid that should be in the blood vessels starts to fill up in their lungs and their alveoli, right? So like COVID was causing people to go into congestive heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, but actually not from a cardiogenic reason. So it was with COVID, the inflammation was changing the permeability of the walls of the capillaries that are wrapped around your alveoli. So you know your alveoli to air sacs that the air has to go down to. And obviously there has to be gas exchange between you know the air and the blood vessels. So wrapped around them, is an extensive network of what they call pulmonary capillaries. And capillaries are the only blood vessels that have the ability to exchange things because they're thin walled um, blood vessels. Arteries can't exchange anything through them. Veins can't exchange anything through them. The sole purpose of an artery is to get blood to a capillary. And the sole purpose of a vein is to take blood away from a capillary. So capillaries are the most numerous blood vessels in your body. And that's where all you know, every square inch of your body is being touched by capillaries because that's the thing that feeds the, allows the blood to feed the cells with oxygen and with sugar and take away the waste products. So like with COVID, the, the inflammation that was occurring was changing what they call the permeability of those walls and making those blood vessels more permeable. So if something's more permeable, it's easier for stuff to leak out of them. So in this case, in COVID, it was the fluid, the plasma, the fluid portion of the blood that was flowing out and they were having what they call a dry land drowning. They were drowning, you know, as if they were submerged in water, but it was all coming from internally in their body. Now, when people have cardiogenic congestive heart failure, cardiogenic acute pulmonary edema, it could be a lot of different etiologies, but it's typically that the heart can't pump well out into the aorta. So we know the left ventricle, the big part of the heart, right, pumps into the aorta. 
if it's weakened from a heart attack, if you have a problem with the valves between the left atrium and the right, uh, I'm sorry, the left atrium and the left ventricle, blood can start going backwards. So when the heart squeezes and it can't push out, it starts to back up. So it backs up into the left atrium, the left atrium backs up into the pulmonary vein, and then the pulmonary vein backs up into the lungs. So now those blood vessels, those pulmonary capillaries are overpressurized because it can't get blood flowing through. So what happens is it forces the plasma into the alveoli, right? And they feel like they're drowning. Now, congestive heart failure, the person lives with it day in and day out. Sometimes you could have what they call right-sided heart failure and left-sided failure. Sometimes they just get right-sided. Sometimes they just get left-sided. But right-sided we see when we do our assessment as jugular vein distension, as we see as pedal edema. Sometimes we see it's called ascites where their stomach swells and stuff like that. Uh, they can get sacral edema, you know, down by their lower back and stuff. That's showing you that the right side of the heart, okay, can't pump well to the lungs and therefore can't pump well to the uh, left side of the heart. And what happens is the venous pressures increase. So you see it, jugular vein distension, pedal edema, any place where the body's low to the ground, okay, like even if you were on your feet all day, you would notice your ankles are swollen, right? That's, that's all venous, extra venous blood. So the right-sided patient in congestive heart failure usually is not as sick as the left-sided because when the left-sided backs up, it backs up into the lungs and then people can't breathe, okay? And th this is the typical cause of, like most people with congestive heart failure, you know, right-sided, they go to their doctor, they're on diuretics, they're on medications to rid themselves of fluids and, uh, you know, help their heart pump better. It's the left-sided one that typically generates the 911 call because it happens suddenly and they, they feel like they're drowning, they, they can't breathe and they call us. Now, what do we have as a new tool to treat somebody in acute pulmonary edema? So for years, we had the non rebreather Didn't work well. You all went on those calls where you were trying to get a non rebreather strapped to the, uh, the patient's face, and they ripped it off, and they fought with you. Because when somebody's short of breath, they don't have oxygen hunger. They have air hunger, right? They don't necessarily care about how much oxygen is in the air they're breathing. They just want to feel like they're getting air into their body. So when you strap a non rebreather over their face, they're like, oh my God, this guy's insane. I can't breathe. And he's putting something over my face that's interfering with my ability to breathe because there's very little flow through a non rebreather, right? So now we have what? We have CPAP. So CPAP is equally as claustrophobic as a non rebreather. It's probably more. So you do have to sell them on the idea. But once they start using CPAP and they open their mouth and they feel the air being forced into them, then they kind of are, start to become compliant with it. But it requires you to know how to use it to get it on quickly, right? To strap it in place because you have to have a tight seal or it doesn't work. But, you know, patients that are compliant with CPAP, that is the ultimate treatment in the hospital. You know, ALS, BLS, hospital, that is the treatment for somebody in congestive heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, because what does it do? It forces air down into the alveoli, displaces the water outward, raises their oxygen level, and makes them feel better. Sure, they're probably going to get some diuresis. They're going to get some, you know, medications to drop some fluid. They're going to have to investigate why they went into failure. But as far as an emergency treatment, it is CPAP. You know, so if you have a patient that's in congestive heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, they're short of breath, you hear them gurgling, they got some rails when you listen to their lungs, you should absolutely put them on CPAP. Okay. I don't know if I would put them on CPAP in the house. I might boogie out to the ambulance um, because it's a pain in the ass to carry somebody out, you know, on CPAP and you need, you know, the, on the portable oxygen, it goes through pretty quick. But I would probably strap a non rebreather on them, get them out to the ambulance, and then get them on CPAP as you're rolling to the hospital. Um, you know, as an appropriate, uh, you know, treatment and stuff like that. Okay, and then the pericarditis, myocarditis, endocarditis, the itises obviously are the infections, right? So these are people who were not lucky and they got an infection. <sighs> pericarditis is the sac around their heart. Myocarditis is the actual heart muscle. Endocarditis is the inside of the heart, like the smooth inside of the heart where the blood actually touches. So, you know, any one of those could happen um, to people. Um, it could be secondary, usually, I shouldn't say could, uh, could be, it probably is secondary to a different bacterial or viral infection they have somewhere else in their body and they're not lucky and it just kind of spreads to their heart. And initially they kind of present like they have the flu. They're kind of weak and tired and short of breath because their heart's being damaged. But, you know, it's not like they get chest pain, crushing chest pain with it, where people think they're having a heart attack. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a very insidious start to it. But obviously, as the infection continues to damage their heart, 
um, they can die. They can get very sick. These are patients who sometimes have to get on LVADs, left ventricular assist devices, to help with the pumping action of their heart. They may need heart transplants and stuff. So anybody could get it, but people are more prone to infection when they're tired and run down, right? When we're tired and run down, our immune system doesn't function properly. So we're more likely to get infections. And if we do get infections, they're more likely to spread throughout our body. Um, so if you ever go to like an otherwise young, healthy person, college student, you know, uh, military, you know, basic training um, and stuff like that. And they're presenting with these kind of like vague symptoms where they said, oh, you know, I thought I was sick. I thought I had the flu. I had a fever for a couple of days, but now I'm just wiped out. I can't, I got no strength. I can't walk. I get short of breath, you know, and, and stuff like that. Always think about that because when a kid goes away to college, right, they leave the parents, you know, nurturing, um, uh, household, right? Mom makes sure they eat and they sleep and it's best they, you know, she can and stuff like that. And now they're at school, they have a heavy academic load, there's a social life. And what happens? They get exhausted. And they're around hundreds, if not thousands of other kids who probably are, you know, some of them are sick also. So they have the potential to pick up an infection and their body's suppressed so they can't fight it. And, um, you know, it's always just something to think about because you guys have colleges, you know, in your area, you have sleepaway colleges at your area where you're going to have these kids dorming, right? Also in the military, right? So, you know, they're in basic training, you know, long days, physical exertion, they're scared, they're tired. Again, their, their immune system is suppressed and it's just something that could happen. You know, it's, there's no real way pre hospitally to diagnose it. It's basically more on history, but uh, you know, in the hospital, they can do an echocardiogram, see if the heart's starting to get enlarged and, you know, an X-ray, maybe the heart looks big and floppy and stuff like that. Um, the one we see the most out of the infections is the pericarditis where the sac gets inflamed. Okay. And you remember from EMT class, you learned a, a traumatic emergency called pericardial tamponade. Pericardial tamponade is that the heart sits in the pericardial sac as a protective sac. And there's a little bit of fluid in there that helps to lubricate the heart as it's going like this. So that it doesn't rub against the sac, right? Or else it'd be painful. And pericarditis, they get an inflammation in that sac in the inside between the wall, the inside wall of the heart and the actual heart itself. So every contraction becomes painful. So now they call us and say, I'm having chest pain, okay? And it, it can initially present as being very uh, similar to a heart attack patient. But there's a couple ways, and again, we're never gonna be 100% certain. We're always gonna treat them as if it's a heart attack. There's a couple ways you can kind of say to yourself, I think this is more pericarditis than an acute myocardial infarction. And what it is is that the patient who has pericarditis has a history of probably being sick with like the flu or virus or something where they've been sick for a couple of days, they've been febrile, you know, and they, you know, they have that history of kind of, I thought I was just sick. I thought I had the flu. Or I thought I had chest, uh, chest cold. Okay. The other thing is position wise, they feel better when they're leaning forward, they shift their pericardial sac forward a little bit. Some of them feel better, like leaning over the table. Some of them feel better, maybe walking and leaning forward. So those are the, the two classic, like, things you would see without any EKG or stuff like that. Um, they would kind of make you lean towards a pericarditis. Again, no harm in giving them aspirin, you know, because you can't be 100% uh, certain or anything like that. But if you have somebody who says, I've been sick for a couple of days, I have a fever, I have chest pain, you know, and it feels better when I lean forward, usually kind of leans towards pericarditis. And, you know, at some point, I don't know if I'll still be around doing this, but at some point there's going to be ultrasound and ambulances in New York. I mean, there's a lot of other states that use it. And it would be a very simple diagnosis with ultrasound to be able to see that. Um, don't tell Glenn or you're going to have, you know, four or five ultrasound machines. Well, they're actually little portable things. Um, but that's, you know, that would be a quick um, way to diagnose if it's, uh, you know, a pericarditis type of problem. Okay, so any questions on the conditions we went over? Okay, so if there's no questions, and again, if there is, just unmute yourself. Let's talk about some of the um, medications that we would use to um, treat these patients. Okay, well, actually, let's just talk about assessment wise first. So we know that obviously most people with cardiac conditions present with some type of discomfort, most of the times in their chest, okay, it can be to their back, right, because you have different walls of your heart. So when you have an anterior wall, lateral wall, septal wall, heart attack, it's more to the front. But when you have a posterior wall, it's more to your back. And when you have an inferior wall, which is the part of the heart that sits right above the belly, it's, uh, it's more over your belly, right? So that's why there are patients who complain more of GI symptoms, right? So it really depends on where it is. And remember, there could be people having chest pain and it's not a heart attack, right? It could be a pulmonary embolism. It could be a thoracic uh, aortic aneurysm. So there's a lot of different things that can cause chest pain, 
And I remember um, Rich and Rob right across the street from Nyack Hospital at the ball field there, they had a tow truck driver that was towing a car. And while he was physically exerting himself, he felt a pain in his chest. And, you know, everybody was like, okay, he must be having an aneurysm because he felt a tearing pain in his chest. And then the guy collapsed up against the fence, really, you know, didn't code, but like couldn't find pulses, couldn't get a blood pressure. And since they were originally, you know, kind of uh, leaning towards the aneurysm, they were getting ready to wheel him, literally not even put him in the ambulance, but wheel him across the street to Nyack. And they did a quick EKG on him and they see he's having mass t massive ST elevation. Now, you could have ST elevation with an aneurysm, but whatever, they decided to transport him to Good Sam because if it was a heart attack, Nyack at that point could not do anything for him. And actually, Nyack still can, but they will be in angioplasty center soon. They're just delayed by COVID. Um, and, um, you know, it turned out that the, the guy was having a massive, massive uh, myocardial infarction involving like pretty much his entire heart. And he had a very, very bad outcome. He's basically a cardiac cripple. Like he just has to be on oxygen all the time. He's in one of those electric carts, you know, because he can't even walk because he's so debilitated and stuff. So his, his thing was just, you know, he had a heart attack. Okay. His was a, not a typical heart attack because again, it happened on stress and stuff like that. Um, and then the other interesting thing about the, the heart attack is, you know, a lot of people wake up with the symptoms or it happens around the time that they're waking up. And the way our body, remember, you know, we were prehistoric at some point, right? We lived in a, a dangerous situation every moment of every day of our lives. So what happens is when the sun starts to rise, your levels of all these different stress hormones and emergency hormones actually rise with the sun and the levels start to increase to prepare you for your stressful day, your dangerous day and stuff like that. And they feel that those, those different stress hormones, those different inflammatory substances, they act upon the cap over the uh, fat and they just break it. And that's what makes you have the actual uh, heart attack. Okay. So what else do we want to do from our assessment? So we know our OPQST, right? Onset, provocation, quality, radiation, severity, and time. So we say, what were you doing? When it happened, that's the onset. Okay. Provocation, does anything make it better or worse? Okay. Quality, can you describe to me in your own words what the pain feels like? Obviously, a heart attack pain feels like a pressure. Uh, you know, uh, somebody sitting on my chest, I feel like there's a belt encircling me. You know, an elephant sitting on my chest is all different. Uh, you know, I just can't get comfortable and stuff. Um, radiation, does the pain go anywhere else? So, you know, for years, they used to say people having chest pain that radiates to their right arm or left arm, you know, is very indicative of a heart attack. You know, looking at the faces, there's a lot of people who've been doing this for a long time. Most heart attack patients do not have pain radiation. And if they do, it's actually usually radiating to their jaw. So it's not usually to their arm, but it can happen. Okay. And, but it's not the most common thing. Uh, severity, you asked them on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the worst, you know, how bad is the pain? And then anytime you do something for them, you ask them if the pain changes, does it get better or worse? And time is how long has it been going on? Dyspnea is the term for shortness of breath. So people who are having heart attacks that involve the left side of their heart tend to have developed the shortness of breath. Orthopnea is the term for trouble breathing positionally. So again, people who have like congestive heart failure, you know they have to sleep sitting up. So if they said to you, you know, every time I lay down, um, I get more short of breath, that's called orthopnea. That's the medical term for it. And the reason obviously is when you're sitting up, the blood pools at the bottom of your lung only, right? Not, not the blood, I'm sorry, the fluid. But when you're lying flat, it pulls over your entire wall, you know, the back wall of your lungs, so you have more trouble breathing. Uh, diaphoresis is the medical term for a cold sweat. And the, there's only one reason why we get a cold sweat, which is that adrenaline is secreted into our bloodstream. And adrenaline is our emergency hormone. So it is only secreted when we think we have an emergency or the body thinks we have an emergency. So like that guy that was in VTAC was in an extremely, extremely diaphoretic state, okay? And it was just because his body sensed he did not have a blood pressure. He didn't have a radio pulse. So it was secreting adrenaline to try to make, raise his blood pressure. The problem is he was already beating too fast to start with and the adrenaline was only making it worse. But, you know, so it's never normal to have a cold sweat. And you know, we're talking cold sweat, like not somebody comes out of a cold shower. We're talking that they were sitting there and they broke out in a cold sweat. That's never normal. It's always worthy of further investigation Unless it's something like, you know, uh, you respond to a car accident and they almost had, you know, they almost got killed by a tractor trailer and they're fine. 
but they're just scared, right? That's a normal response to being scared because again, the body thought there was an emergency going on. The restless and anxiety, right? Because they know something's wrong. Your body, your brain knows something's wrong. So it makes you restless and anxious. The feeling of impending doom, right? So we've all been on calls where the patient says, I don't feel like I can stay awake anymore, you know, and stuff like that. I, I feel like I'm going to pass out. So, you know, some people are hypochondriacs, but there are truly some patients who have that sense. And sometimes they do close their eyes and don't wake up. So I always tell them, you know, stay with me, talk to me, you know, tell me about your kids, tell me about this, tell me about whatever to, you know, try to keep them uh, awake and stuff like that. If you had that cardiac patient, right, the chest pain patient going to the hospital and they say like, I can't stay awake anymore, I feel like I'm passing out. And you probably, if they code, you're going to see like a little seizure activity, right? Uh, their eyes may like roll back in their head a little bit. They're going to become unresponsive. You don't find a pulse. If you have the wherewithal, I would precordial thump them. I would take my fist and punch them right dead center in the center of their chest. If you do it at the totally right time, which is as soon as they code, and they code in V-fib, that acts as a mini defibrillation. So while everybody else is getting the defibrillator and you do that, they may actually just wake up and say, what the hell happened? You know, like, I don't know what happened. Um, now, if you totally misdiagnosed them and they just closed their eyes because they were getting tired and bored of you and you punched them in the chest, they will also wake up, but from, a, you know, they'll be a little more annoyed in the second situation. Okay. Uh, nausea and vomiting, very common in the abdominal inferior wall MI, right? Because again, it's by the stomach. Fatigue is the most common complaint of who? So fatigue is the most common complaint in the elderly having a heart attack. The elderly do not feel the pain because they typically start having uh, neuropathies. They, their, their nerve endings start to get uh, weak as you get older. So the diabetic, the elderly, they don't typically have chest pain. They kind of have more fatigue, general malaise, you know, they're more tired. And the other person, um, a class of people who tend to have vague symptoms are women, right? Women, women a lot of times don't complain of that crushing chest pain. Um, I don't know if it's because women don't complain as much as men, you know, they kind of tolerate the, the pain better than men do and stuff like that. But, you know, when they ask you like, what three types of patients have atypical? So atypical means not typical uh, complaints in a heart attack. It's the diabetic, it's the elderly, okay, and it's the female patient. And females, it's more common for them to have the inferior wall MI and have the GI symptoms, okay? Palpitations, like that guy in VTAC where he felt like his heart was racing, and the atypical presentation means that they just don't have that crushing chest pain. So anybody have any questions on that page? Okay, so what do we do? So we have somebody where we think it's either angina or heart attack. We make them comfortable. If they have a big belly, maybe loosen their belt a little bit, okay, so that their stomach sags down, they're a little more comfortable. Okay, again, if their oxygen saturation is below 94%, okay, we would want to put them on some supplemental oxygen. But either way, I would probably put them on a nasal cannula for just a, a little bit, you know, maybe a liter or two, even if they're a satin, you know, above... Uh, 94, 95%. Just again, from a medical legal standpoint, don't be, you know, don't be shocked if, you know, the medics come and, you know, say, oh, he doesn't need oxygen. He's sat in at 98% and they take it off. But really from a medical legal standpoint, you're not going to really hurt them by having a couple liters of oxygen on them. And they're going to get it back on them in the hospital anyway, because most hospitals, when they have their chest pain orders, it says oxygen by nasal cannula at two liters. Then we're going to give them aspirin, right? And we know that in New York state, we give them four, um, 81 milligram chewable baby aspirin. So they're non enterically coated, okay, which means they have no hard coating because you want them to dissolve and go to work immediately. And they have to chew it and swallow it. If a patient tells you that prior to getting there, they took their own aspirin and they swallowed it and it had the hard coating on it, you would actually give them another set of aspirin, okay? Because the ones that are coated are not going to go to work immediately. They're going to take an hour to go to work. And this person doesn't have that hour, okay? So you would give it to them immediately. If they tell you their aspirin is 10 years old, you'd still give it, to, you'd still give them yours. The reason why is the 324 milligrams that we're giving them is half the dose of aspirin that we used to take when we had a headache. So we're not getting, giving them a very, very high dose of aspirin when we're treating them for a heart attack. Okay. So again, 481 milligram true baby aspirin. Now, who cannot, what heart attack patient cannot get aspirin? Okay. So everybody says GI bleeds, GI bleeds, GI bleeds. So the one that absolutely cannot get aspirin, never get aspirin, is the patient who has a history of anaphylaxis to aspirin. So before you give any patient 
anything, you have to say to them, you know, do you, have, do you have a history of having allergic reactions to the medication you want to give them? A lot of people just say, do you have any allergies to medicines? If you're going to actually administer a medication, you have to ask them that specific one. Do you have any allergies to aspirin? Okay. Now, some patients may turn to say, my doctor told me not to take aspirin anymore. So then you have to say to them, why was that? That is probably that they were on aspirin for arthritic pain and they developed a GI bleed from it. And the doctor said, you can't take aspirin anymore. They haven't taken aspirin in 10 years. Now they're having a heart attack. You can give them that 481 milligram aspirin and it is not going to cause them to have a GI bleed. Okay. If they refuse it, you know, you could always say to them, listen, if God forbid you are having a heart attack, the benefit of these aspirins far outweighs the very minimal risk of you having some bleeding in your stomach. But if you don't want me to give it to you, I can't give it to you. So you would have to decide. And if they don't want to take it, then you would just document that they're, you know, they, you offered it to them and they don't want to take it. But the, the only one you absolutely cannot give aspirin to is a patient who has a history of anaphylaxis. Because imagine if a patient's really having a heart attack and you cause them to have an anaphylactic reaction in the middle of it, then it would be a you know, big issue. Okay. Um, now, the other medication that we may be able, so we said oxygen possibly, aspirin definitely. The other medication we possibly can give it to them would be nitroglycerin. Now, we don't carry it on a BLS level. So it would be that the patient has a history of angina, therefore they have nitroglycerin. So we said in angina, nitroglycerin is the treatment because it vasodilates the blood vessels, gets more blood to the area of the heart that's been deprived and relieves that lactic acid and they feel wonderful, right? One, two, three, they feel better, okay? In a heart attack, it's kind of a different reason we give it, which is that it's not going to open up the clogged vessel. The vessel is clogged. You cannot vasodilate a clogged vessel to the point where it really helps. So you're giving nitro for two reasons. And again, this is a patient who has nitro themselves, right? So we're just assisting them with taking it, which means up to and including us giving it to them if they don't know how to take it themselves, okay? So we're giving it two reasons. We're giving it what they call diagnostically, and then we're giving it what they call therapeutically. Diagnostically means we're giving it to them that if the pain goes away with the nitrates, we're a little suspicious if it's a heart attack versus angina, right? We don't expect the pain of a heart attack to go away with angina. It may lessen, but we don't expect it to go away completely, right? And if it does, then we kind of be leaning more towards angina, which again, who cares, right? We're taking it to the hospital either way, okay? The therapeutic part of it, okay, is that, remember I said there's one vessel that's blocked, or actually you could have a heart attack where multiple vessels are blocked and you're not gonna probably live, but let's just say, you know, it's a, it's a small vessel, not on the left side of your heart, so you know, you're gonna survive this thing. So you're not going to dilate that blocked vessel with the nitro to the point where blood gets through the blockage. But remember, if this is a patient who's up there in age, okay, they're going to have collaterals, right, collateral arteries in the area, and you're going to dilate those collateral arteries and get, therefore, get more blood to the area that's been deprived and, uh, you know, help them. So that's why we give nitrates to a patient. Now, in saying that, nitroglycerin is probably the most dangerous drug for an EMT to administer because there are side effects to it. So we want to make sure, first of all, that the patients are not on any erectile dysfunction medications. The active ingredient in Viagra Cialis Levitra is something called Sedelafil. Um, and Sedelafil originally was being studied as a blood pressure medication to keep blood pressure down by relaxing blood vessels. Nitroglycerin also relaxes blood vessels. So you're giving two medications that do the same thing and you could have what's called potentiation. You give two medicines that do the same thing, they do it way too well. And now you vasodilate that person to the point where they drop their blood pressure and they no longer have a blood pressure. And a patient who's having a heart attack who doesn't have a blood pressure will not perfuse their coronary arteries and they'll have a bigger heart attack. So that's kind of the issue. In fact, Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra was not, you know, that was not the name of it back then. It was being used to, um, you know, see if it would work on blood pressure problems. And they found when they had patients come in, you know, to interview them and ask questions about, you know, side effects, that uh, I guess some very honest guy said, you know, um, my only side effect is that I get an erection every time I see a woman walk by. And what happens is then is I guess some smart marketing people said, you know, screw the blood pressure part of it. We have enough blood pressure medications out there. We will market it as an erectile dysfunction medication. So it was the, you know, Viagra was the first erectile dysfunction medications and it's made billions and billions and billions of dollars. But that's the, you know, the side effect of it is if you give nitrates, and uh, erectile dysfunction medications, they will potentiate and drop somebody's blood pressure. Now, New York State says 72 hours. Uh, in all honesty, Viagra is kind of out of your system in eight hours or so. 
uh, you know, probably have no risk after like four hours. There is a long acting Cialis where like the commercial says, you know, you could take it Friday afternoon and you're good for the whole weekend. That one I'd probably say to 72 hours might be of concern because it's delayed release. And I'm not sure if there's a delayed release Levitra, but you know, but the state protocol does say 72 hours. So it's, even though it's kind of a crazy uh, window. Um, now, those of you that took the protocol update, the online protocol update, right? You know, specifically in the protocol update, they said you could ignore that now and give those patients nitroglycerin. So I then, you know, <laughs> me annoying that I am, I, uh, I wrote a letter to the state, an email to the state and said, you're totally wrong. You know, if you look in the PDR, you look here, you look there. I said, it's, you can't tell EMTs that they can do that. You know, it's wrong. So they had the CMAC doctors review it and they said, okay, you know, you're right. Not that I'm right, but that, that, that is the right uh, thing that you can't give it. And they, but they never actually redid the protocol update. They just sent out an advisory memorandum saying, you know, um, yes, you should not give um, nitroglycerin to people who have taken erectile dysfunction medications. Um, so, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, but if it does happen, it would be disastrous. The other thing to give nitro, we know that their systolic blood pressure has to be over 120 because it has the ability, obviously, to lower blood pressure. Um, and then the last thing is you have to be cautious on the inferior wall MI patient. So we said the inferior wall MI is the bottom wall of the heart above your stomach, right? And then that gives you more GI symptoms. And people uh, who have inferior wall MIs are given nitrates, bottom out their blood pressure very quickly. So again, you're gonna have the same issue as the erectile dysfunction medications where the heart's not going to be perfused. Now, some of you are gonna say, well, how are we gonna tell that on a BLS level? So without an EKG, you cannot be 100% certain. You know, with an EKG, you would see ST elevations and leads two, three, and AVF. So when you do a 12 lead, you're looking at pictures of the heart and they're labeled. So the, the pictures of the bottom wall of the hearts are lead two, three, and AVF. Um, so how would you tell, right? Because you're not doing an EKG. So the first thing is they have more gastrointestinal symptoms than they have chest pain. The second thing is that typically people have inferior LMIs are have a normal to slow heart rate, right? So say they're gonna be in their 60s versus their 90s and 80s and 90s, where a lot of people having heart attacks get a little tachycardic because they're scared. Inferior LMI patients, because of in, in influence of the vagus nerve down there, they tend to be you know, normal to slow. So if you have somebody who's having you know, abdominal discomfort, you know, maybe they got a cold sweat, but they, you know, they have more abdominal complaints and their heart rate is kind of a normal heart rate. I would stay away from nitrates until somebody comes and puts them on the EKG machine. Now, going back up to the erectile dysfunction medications, because it's being used for erectile dysfunction, you know, um, we would think we only have to ask about this in a male patient. But the issue is that they found other uses for sedelafil, for the active ingredient. And one of the conditions is called pulmonary hypertension, which is high blood pressure from the right side of the heart to the lungs. Um, and women could have what they call idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Sometimes, you know, women prime their lives, healthy, no problems, not a smoker. They start getting short of breath and, you know, they don't know what's going on. They go think, you know, I have a pneumonia. They go for all this testing and stuff. And they find out that for some reason, it's hard for the right side of the heart to pump to the lungs. Okay, now, because you can't get that deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart to the, to the lungs, you become short of breath, right? Because you can't get rid of the carbon dioxide, you can't pick up oxygen. So the patient complains about shortness of breath. They found that sedelafil, because it is a vasodilator, a smooth muscle relaxant, right? That's how it allows a man to have an erection, actually relaxes those pulmonary blood vessels, the pulmonary artery blood vessels, and makes them, um, you know, be able to carry on their daily activities and stuff like that. So I would say you would want to ask a patient their history. And if anybody, male or female, says they have pulmonary hypertension, okay, then they can't get, and you, well, I shouldn't say they can't get it, but you'd have to ask to see what medications they are. And then you'd have to have the ability to look up those medications and see if they're being, you know, if they're a sedelafil-based medication. The other condition would be a guy where they have BPH, where their prostate um, gland is enlarging. So those are men who like urinate in spurts and stuff like that. Um, it's like non-cancerous, it's benign, but they have an enlarged prostate, uh, you know, gland. So they would, they can also be taking those types of medications. Okay. So that would be another time besides just, you know, ED medications where you would think about it. Okay. So with nitro, we can give a maximum of three doses, just like the patient can five minutes apart, just like the patient can. 
okay? And as long as the systolic blood pressure stays above 120, okay? So you wanna give the nitro, recheck the blood pressure, and if the blood pressure, the patient continues to have chest pain and the blood pressure stays above 120, you can give a second dose, wait another two to three minutes. If the blood pressure stays above 120, you can give a third dose, okay? You don't have to stay in the house to do it, okay? But you, know, you, can, uh, you can give up to three doses. And then obviously at this point, since we can't be 100% certain whether or not they're having a heart attack or angina, uh, because the pain's not relieved, we would be transporting them at this point to Good Sam because that is our primary angioplasty center. But in a couple of months, it could be NIAC or Good Sam as soon as they send out the, uh, the you know, announcement that they can do uh, emergency angioplasty. Aspirin, okay, is a drug that we use to prevent what's called platelet aggregation or clumping, which is the platelets sticking to themselves and forming a clot, okay? So most heart attacks are what we call a thrombotic event. So you have two things. You have embolic embolisms and thrombotics, which are thrombosis. Embolic is more like the pulmonary embolism where you have a DVT in your leg, it breaks loose and lodges in your lung, it floats embolic, right? A stroke, something floats up to your brain and lodges up there. So that's more embolic, it means it originated from somewhere else. A heart attack is thrombotic, which means that at the site of that plaque rupture, you developed a clot because of the platelets, okay? Now, the only reason it makes a big deal is that in a thrombotic event, aspirin really does help big time. I mean, it's the number one reducer of mortality in somebody having a heart attack is the early administration of baby aspirin, okay? So again, aspirin is thrombotic. I'm sorry, not aspirin. Uh, a heart attack is a thrombotic event, okay? Strokes, pulmonary embolisms, embolic events. Aspirin interferes with platelet aggregation or clumping, so it slows down the process, okay? It gives the person time to have angioplasty, have that blood vessel, you know, opened up, okay, and have a stent placed in there so it can't reclose. So indication is patient the setting of where you think they're having a heart attack or you can't tell the difference with their presentation between angina or something like that. Again, you're not gonna hurt somebody giving them aspirin unless they have a history of anaphylaxis to aspirin. Okay, so that would be the big one. So history of aspirins, okay, uh, history of allergies to aspirins is the number one contraindication. If they have a recent GI bleed, right? So they're telling you, yeah, like a day ago, I had some blood in my, uh, in a, excuse me, in the toilet, I would call medical control and say, here's the deal. We have a patient suspect having a heart attack. You know, and they're telling us two days ago they had some bright red blood in the toilet. Do you want us to give the aspirin or do you want us to hold off until we get to the you get to the hospital? And you'd be guided by whatever they tell you. If they tell you to hold off, you just document that you contacted medical control, spoke to Dr. You know, Smith, um, and we're told to withhold aspirin because of the history of the recent GI bleed, and then you're covered. Okay. I'll just tell you the hospitals actually, I'm sure Pete could uh, vouch for this. The hospitals call all the time with heart attack patients saying, we didn't see on the electronic PCR that aspirin was given. So we need to know because our nurses also didn't give it and it would be a big issue if that patient did not get aspirin. So, you know, I'll always get, and I'll say, no, here it is. It says they, you know, they gave them aspirin and then they want you to send them a copy. Now, sometimes I'm looking on the ALS PCR and there's no aspirin and they didn't document given by BLS. Like, so let's say you guys got there first. So then I would call Pete and say, please, 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 you know, look on your PCR and tell me that you guys gave aspirin so that it wasn't like we all blew it. And, you know, 90% of the time BLS got there first, they gave aspirin or the patient took their own aspirin appropriately. And, but again, if nobody documents, nobody knows that, right? You know it because you were there, but nobody who's reading the chart a day later uh, knows it. Okay. So again, if you have any questions, just interrupt. Now, this is showing you what happens in a heart attack. So this is the coronary artery. The yellow part is what we call the lumen, which is where the blood flows through. Because of this chronic, ignore the little red dots right now, but because of this chronic bad diet this guy had, he had fat that kind of stuck there. And this little yellow thing along the top of the fat is the fibrous cap. In this guy's case, it's very small, which is why it ruptured. You'd actually want this to be thicker even though, and again, this is a gross exaggeration of how high the fat deposits would be, it's never this high. Some people will say, well, I wouldn't want to have a thick cap because it even narrows the lumen more, right? I mean, if you have a, an inch cap here, there's going to be a tiny little place for blood to get through. Um, but it's not usually this, this is an exaggerated drawing. You know, it's usually a, a centimeter above the level of the blood vessel. So you want a nice thick cap because it's less likely to rupture because high blood pressure could also cause it to rupture, right? The blood going through here is at a higher pressure. So anyway, it ruptured, okay? And now what happens is platelets come 
and they start sticking in to the clot, but they don't stop. They keep on covering and covering and covering and they completely close off the entire blood vessel and they just shut the whole thing down and you know the person has a heart attack. Now, as a comforting thought, right? You could have went for a stress test and passed. You could have been running your little heart out on the uh, treadmill and did not have chest pain. Okay, but then I don't know, the doctor decides to follow up and do a cardiac catheterization where they actually go up into the arteries and look. And he says, oh my God, Frank, you have 90% occlusion in two blood vessels. Okay, so why didn't I have chest pain when I'm running? Right, that's the question. So it's probably because you had collaterals to service the area. But believe it or not, there are people who have, you know, coronary artery bypass surgery, angioplasty, and they've been living probably for years with almost a complete occlusion of their blood vessel, okay, because there was so much fat down there, but they didn't have the platelet rupture, okay, so it didn't get completely shut off. So since they were getting some minimal blood through there, okay, they did not have chest pain. Now, these are probably not people who live a very active lifestyle. You know, they're not out running and, and exercising and playing basketball because they probably would develop some chest pain then. But, um, you know, I can't tell you how many people have, uh, have told me, you know, um, that they had, uh, you know, angioplasty, uh, angioplasty, I'm sorry, cardiac catheterization done, and they were told that their blood vessels are significantly narrowed. So the treatment would be to stent the patient, okay? Um, but there's a lot of studies pointing out now if the patient's totally asymptomatic, it's better actually to manage it pharmacologically, okay? Um, so the risk of having, you know, uh, um, cardiac catheterization and, and stenting is um, too high as compared to just managing them pharmacologically. So, you know, obviously the doctor in the hospital who's doing the cardiac catheterization would not get paid um, a lot of money if he doesn't stent you. So usually what they do, you sign a waiver saying, you know, if they find something, they're allowed to treat it. So you'll wake up and they'll say, okay, we found two vessels that were pretty occluded. So we stented them and you'll be like, okay. But if you had gone to say a, a you know, big hospital in the city where those doctors don't get paid by procedures, they're on salary, you know, they're, they're, it's a teaching hospital. Um, they probably would say to you, okay, you know, we found a couple arteries that are pretty closed. And what we're going to do is we're going to manage it conservatively. And we're going to put you on these different medications and let's see if that'll take care of your pain. And, you know, maybe if not, we'll look at it again in a month or two or three months or six months. And then maybe we will go back and, you know, uh, and stent them. So they usually uh, nowadays in teaching hospitals are not as aggressive with doing it, but in hospitals where doctors get paid by procedures, trust me, if you have good insurance, you'll get stented. Okay. So aspirin is a drug that we give orally. They chew it and swallow it, right? Just not swallow it. They have to chew it and swallow it. Before you hand them the aspirin, make sure to tell them that they need to chew it completely because most people do not chew their medications, right? They just swallow it. And you could say to them, it may just taste a little horrible. We'll give you some water or something to, you know, to, uh, get it down there. Okay. Again, in New York state, the dose is 481 milligram for a total dose of 324. Sometimes it's actually 81 point something. So some people just round it up sometimes 325, but 324, 325 is fine. Nitroglycerin, we said is a medication that's a smooth muscle relaxant. So it hopes to get more blood to the area of the heart that needs it. Okay. We give it to patients who have a history of angina, have their own nitroglycerin and are experiencing chest discomfort. And the contraindications, I put allergies to nitrates in there. Um, I don't know if it's really possible, but, you know, after I wrote this lecture, I actually transported a patient from Good Sam to Westchester for um, cardiac bypass surgery, and it said in big red sticker on his chart, allergic to nitroglycerin. I never heard of it before, but I guess it's possible. The other day, I took an asthmatic patient, and it said allergies to um, albuterol. So, I don't know. I guess it is possible. I've never heard of it, but I guess it's possible. Okay, they have to have a blood pressure. Okay, um, actually, that's wrong. It used to be a blood pressure above um, 120 milligrams, right? Not below. So that's actually a typo. Or this is, oh, no, I'm sorry. It's, it's contraindication. I'm sorry. So yeah, allergies to nitro, blood pressure below 120, right? They have to have at least 120. The suspected inferior wall MI patient, right? Where they have more GI symptoms. And I don't know, my dog's trying to eat someone. Um, and uh, the last one would be, is they're having an active GI bleed at the time where you could call medical control and be guided by what they, uh, they want you to do, okay? Again, we don't want to use it uh, in patients who have recently taken erectile dysfunction medications. Okay, patients who are being treated with uh, Sildenafil for uh, BPH, okay? And patients who have BPH, okay, 
may be taking other kinds of medications called alpha blockers. In fact, this Flomax, you've all been on calls, you know, with a male patient where they've, you know, one of the medications they put down there is Flomax because again, a guy has a problem with his urine flow. So I guess some marketing person thought of Flomax. Um, alpha blockers can also drop blood pressures. So I would be careful. Hold on one second. Daniel, you're home? Oh, good. Congratulations. So how was the ride? Good. Okay, so um, all of those would be things where, you know, I, w I would say we would use it, you know, with great caution and maybe just delay getting, you know, delay giving it till they get to the hospital, let the hospital give it to them. Again, we said we can give three doses, five minutes apart, as long as their blood pressure stays above 120. The route is sublingual under the tongue, right? So they have them lift their tongue. If it's an elderly patient who cannot lift their tongue and you have to lift their tongue for them, the only way you could do that is with a four by four. So, you know, put on gloves and grab their tongue with a four by four and then lift it up. You can't grab a tongue with just gloves on, it'll slip right out. Okay, so that's what we wanted to do tonight. Let's review the test. Does anybody have any questions on anything before we review the, uh, the test? share this. Okay, so you guys can see the test, right? Yes, okay. Is Diane on, Diane Conklin? Yep, so you can thank Diane because she was beating me up. Okay, so what is the recommended next step after we defibrillate? So this happens automatically with an AED, right? After you shock, when you're uh, using AED, it immediately tells you to do what? Years ago, it was check for a pulse. Now it's what? Start CPR, okay? So when you defibrillate somebody, they were in V-fib, right? Because AED will only shock uh, V-fib or VTAC uh, over a rate of 180. So the, after you shock them, one of two things could happen, right? You could convert them out of the VTAC into a perfusing rhythm and they could wake up. Obviously, you're not going to start CPR in that case. I would leave the AD pads in place. I would shut the AD off because it's going to be screaming at you to do CPR. And that could be a little disconcerting to the, um, the patient. Um, but uh, if they don't wake up and talk to you, then you need to start CPR because it's one of two conditions. It's they're, they're still in cardiac arrest. So obviously, they need CPR. Or it could be that you actually did get them out of the V-fib and they're back in a rhythm. But the pressure that that rhythm is generating is not enough to perfuse their brain. And that's why they're not waking up. In that case, they feel that the CPR would actually benefit the patient. I know, uh, you know, some of you have been doing this for a long time. Years ago in CPR, we used to say that if you did chest compressions over a beating heart, you would throw the heart out of rhythm, but it's not true. So you can do CPR. And you will actually probably in that case, right, because this is a patient we said has alive now, just not with a good blood pressure. The pain of the compressions will actually probably get that patient to open their eyes and talk to you. And uh, you know, then at that point, you would just wanna make sure they're on oxygen and get ready to log roll them if at any point they start to vomit or anything like that. Okay, question number two. So that one is gonna be uh, resume CPR, okay? Question number two, your EMS team arrives to find a 59-year-old gentleman lying on the floor. You determine that he's unresponsive. What is the next step in assessment and management of this patient? So all we know is that this guy is lying on the floor. He's unresponsive. Do we know if he's alive or dead? The answer is no. So everybody always answers either apply the AED or open the patient's airway, but the right thing would be what? D, to assess the patient for breathing and a pulse, right? Because all we know is he could have syncopized, right? He could just be fainted on the floor and we don't need to do anything other than, you know, maybe elevate his legs, put him on some oxygen. Number three, you're performing chest compressions during an adult resuscitation attempt. Which rate should you use to perform the chest compressions? Um, those of you that are writing down question three is a certain choice. Uh, you're wasting your time because the test gets scrambled. So they're not gonna be in the same order. But uh, you, can, you can write it down, but just don't read the question before you answer it because it may not be the right choice. You're performing chest compressions during an adult resuscitation attempt. Which rate should you use to perform compressions? So I know you guys have tons of Lucases, so you probably don't have to worry about that, but perfectly done CPR is A, a rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute, which is what Lucas does. Okay. You're treating a 62-year-old male patient who has a sudden onset of retrosternal chest pain slash pressure, which began at rest approximately 30 minutes ago. So just based on that, because it began at rest, we're going to lean towards the heart attack patient. Patient has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, that's like high cholesterol, 
for which she's taking low pressure, which is a medication, a beta blocker medication to reduce blood pressure, and aldosterone, which is a medication for hyperlipidemia. Patient has no known allergies. Vital signs are a pulse of 58 and regular, okay? Respirations of 16 and non-labored, a blood pressure 122 over 76, and a pulse ox in 97% and 21% FiO2 is room air, right? 21% inspired oxygen is room air. So let's just go back, pulse of 58. So some people may say, well, that's pretty slow, okay? So one is he could be having that inferior OMI, but we don't think so because he's having more chest pain. But when you're on a beta blocker, like low pressure, that's how it controls your blood pressure. It makes your heart beat slower and with less force. So that's a normal pulse rate in a patient who's on low pressure. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with that. So I asked, what is the most important initial intervention for this patient? So we have oxygen by nasal cannula at 46 liters per minute, oxygen by a non rebreathing face mask at 15 liters per minute, aspirin, chewed and swallowed only if able to chew. I guess I should put swallow also or nitro 0.4 milligrams sublingual. So in this patient, does he really need oxygen at this point? Okay, so I said maybe two liters, but the choice is four to six liters, right? Definitely not a non-rebreather because he's satin pretty good. So probably the most important thing in this case, okay, would be to ask them if they have any allergies to aspirin and if they don't to put them, to give them aspirin. So I would go with C in this one because it doesn't tell us that the patient has um, nitrates right? So we don't carry them. So, the, you know, we can't really give them nitrates unless they have it. The most possible, oh, actually one thing with the nitrates, how do we know the nitrates are what they call potent? They're still good because the problem with nitroglycerin is people may have it and never use it. And because of that, they're very reluctant to go out and spend money and get it again when it expires. So how do we know that somebody's nitrates are still good? What, what is the patient experience when it goes under the tongue, right? So if it's the tablets, they feel a burning sensation a little tingling sensation under their tongue, and they get a mild headache, right, because of the vasodilation of the blood vessels. If it's the spray, they still may get a little tingling under their tongue, but not as much, and they still get the headache. So that's how you kind of know nitrates are um, still potent. You would expect them to, you know, have that feeling that, like, if they feel it dissolving or tingling under their tongue, and they get a little bit of a headache. Okay, what's the most serious possible side effect of aspirin administration? So we got GI bleeding, precipitous hypotension, which is that, you know, they drop their blood pressure suddenly, seizures or anaphylaxis. So we didn't really talk about aspirin dropping blood pressure. We talked about nitro. So aspirin doesn't really drop your blood pressure unless you're having an anaphylactic reaction. We didn't talk about seizures at all because that's not a side effect of uh, aspirin. So I guess it would be between gastrointestinal bleeding and anaphylaxis. So the most serious possible side effect would be anaphylaxis, right? Because picture this person, you know, says they can't breathe, and now you have to give them epi, and the reason you're treating them was they had a heart attack. So now you're giving a heart that's kind of uh, in danger, you're giving them the one drug that they should never get in a heart attack, which is epinephrine. So in case, in that case, I would actually say drive fast to the hospital would be an appropriate treatment and dump it in the emergency room and let them figure out what to do. Okay, number six is aspirin can assist a patient experiencing acute myocardial infarction by interfering with platelet aggregation or clumping. So we said that's what occurs when the plaque ruptures, right? That the platelets go and aggregate or clump and close off the artery. So that would be a true, okay? As per the New York State BLS protocol, a patient must have a systolic blood pressure at least what for an EMT to assist a patient taking nitroglycerin? So we said that EMTs have to have 120. Um, the paramedics, it fluctuates between 100 and 90 and 100. Um, personally, I always go with the 120. I've had a few cases where I've given nitrates to little old people and they passed out on me and stuff. So I, I stay with 120. The vast majority of acute myocardial infarctions are caused by. So spasm of the coronary artery could cause a heart attack, but it's more typical of that Prince metal angina. So saying the vast majority, that's not the vast majority. A rupture of a coronary artery aneurysm. That could happen, but that patient will die, right? If you rupture a coronary artery, the pericardial sac will fill with blood and, and basically crush the heart. So that's somebody basically who, you know, will die before you even get there and they'll not be resuscitatable. Very rare. Embolic blockage or thrombotic rupture. So an embolic blockage we said is more like a stroke, okay, or a pulmonary embolism where a clot breaks loose from somewhere else and then lodges further down the bloodstream. A thrombotic rupture is more of what happens in the heart attack, the acute myocardial infarction, because there was that fat that had the cap on it and it ruptured and then the platelets went there. So the answer here would be D. Again, if I'm going too fast or you have questions, unmute yourself. 
You're called to a business establishment where you find a 70 year old gentleman complaining of severe substernal chest pain pressure that started while he was fighting with another patron. Okay. Um, patient states pain came on suddenly. It was a nine on a scale of one to 10. Patient denies any recent illness or injury. Patient has a history of prostate cancer. Patient states similar symptoms last month while shoveling the snow. Patient states pain has slightly diminished since law enforcement has placed him on oxygen. What is the most likely cause? Okay, now we can never be 100% certain. So actually any of these could be diagnosis, right? They could just be straining a muscle. They could have a, thoracic, a thoracic aortic aneurysm. They could be having a heart attack or they could have angina. So I don't, I mean, I made the question, but I don't think it's a great question. But because it happened with exertion and it's starting to get better with oxygen, okay, I would assume I picked A as the right answer, angina pectoris, because, you know, really the rest of them, the pain does not go away, right? The heart attack pain doesn't go away. Muscle strain pain doesn't go away in the short term from when it happened. And a thoracic aortic aneurysm doesn't go away until either it ruptures and you die or they actually fix it. So, so I would say that one's going to be more like angina. You have administered one dose of subaglone nitro to your 64-year-old male patient who has a history of exertional chest pain. So it happened while he was doing something. Patient told you that while raking leaves, he developed substernal chest pain that was typical for his angina pain. So of course, you'd ask yourself, why are you raking leaves You know when this happens to you, but whatever. Patient's vital signs are a blood pressure of 140 over 90, pulse of 94 and regular, respiration is 24 and labored, pulse ox of 94% on room air. You assisted a patient taking a sublingual nitro and now the patient states, I feel like I have to vomit and pass out. And the patient suddenly loses consciousness and does not respond to, to, respond to verbal or painful stimuli. So what happened? He took his nitro. He was probably sitting up or standing up, which you should never do, right? You should have him on a stretcher with his legs elevated or on a couch with his legs elevated when you're doing nitro. And he dropped his blood pressure, okay? And because he dropped his blood pressure, he wasn't perfusing his brain and he passed out. So now what do we need to do? So I said, pick a order that you need to go into. So hopefully nobody says have ALS step it up, right? Because yes, that'd be great if they get there and stuff like that, but you are all highly trained EMTs. This is a patient who's syncopized and you should be able to pretty much manage it fine on your own. So I would say the first thing I'd wanna do is put the patient supine and elevate their legs because that's gonna you know, raise their blood pressure a little bit. And then I check for a pulse, make sure they're not dead. I wouldn't check for the pulse first, although some people would argue that because when somebody passes out because their blood pressure is low, you may not be able to get a pulse in their wrist. That would trigger you to start CPR. And the only reason they may not have a pulse in their wrist is just that they dropped their blood pressure. So I would put them supine. So I'd go with five. So I guess we're over here. I check for a pulse, which is two. Then I'd probably put them on some oxygen, which would be three. Then I would get a set of vital signs. And then I'd say to ALS, where are you? You know. Um, that's personally how I would do it. So I would do five, three, five, two, three, four, one. Okay. Again, if you're not confident or, you know, you, you like having them there or something like that, or, you know, it's, uh, it's Nick Cavalieri who everybody loves and, you know, you want them there right away, then, uh, you know, maybe you go with one first, but I, I would do five, two, three, four, and one. Okay. Um, it could be Donna Marks and she'll take the Lucas out, right? No, I'm just teasing. As per the New York State protocol, okay, the correct dosage of aspirin to be administered to an adult patient experiencing signs and symptoms in acute myocardial infarction are. So in the New York State protocol, it's 324 milligrams. This is actually a question that was on the state exam. And a lot of students answered 160 to 324 because that's actually the ALS protocol. Um, but uh, the New York State protocol for BLS says 324 milligrams. So that's what you would answer there. Which of the following are possible symptoms of an acute myocardial infarction in a 72-year-old male patient? So this is an elderly patient who we suspect having, could possibly have atypical presentations besides typical presentations. So we said an elderly fatigue is very common. People having heart attacks, chest discomfort is common. Abdominal is com discomfort is common. Jaw pain is common right? Or I shouldn't say common, but it happens. And nausea is common, especially if it's the inferior OMI. So all of these are possible symptoms in an elderly patient having a heart attack. So I would do uh, D, one, two, three, four, and five. Almost done, halfway. The most common cause of death in the 24 hours surrounding a patient's acute myocardial infarction. So somebody has a heart attack, okay? In the first 24 hours, there is a marked increase in people dying in the first 24 hours, even if they have angioplasty. Um, and the most common cause is what they call sudden cardiac death, which is really that 
because of the ischemia of the heart muscle, they go into V-fib, okay? So really, most patients post heart attack, post angioplasty, go to a monitored bed, right? They go to a monitored bed for at least 24 hours uh, for two reasons. One is the, you know, they need to be on a monitored bed in case they go into V-fib. The second thing is that obviously if you have angioplasty, they put a pretty large hole in your femoral vessel and there's always a risk of bleeding. So they have to keep you supine, you know, typically for 24 hours with a sandbag holding direct pressure um, on that. So it's a little difficult to fall asleep, but um, that's what they would typically do post angioplasty. Okay, so this one we'll say is uh, sudden cardiac death. 14, which of the following patients commonly present with atypical symptoms when experiencing symptoms of an acute myocardial infarction? So they, what patients have most likely not to say crushing chest pain? They may have other complaints. So he said geriatric patients because of neuropathies of the nerve or the breakdown of the nerves of old age. Diabetic patients with because of neuropathies because of the diabetes. It's one of the things that diabetes does. And female patients just because women are always a little more difficult than men. No, I'm teasing. Um, so this one, I would say D, all of the above. The correct rate of CPR in a six-year-old patient. So the rate of CPR is the same across all age groups. So it's always 100 to 120 compressions. Doesn't matter. That is, we don't actually often get that in there unless the patient's intubated and we set the machine to continuous or we do continuous CPR. Because if we have to pause, if we're doing 15 to two or 30 to two, um, we wouldn't get the full amount of compressions in because we're pausing to ventilate. But if you're doing CPR where the patient's intubated, um, if you're doing Lucas, you go to continuous, right? And if you're um, doing manual, then you have somebody compress nonstop for uh, um, two minutes until they get tired, okay? Now it says, what's the correct ratio of compressions to ventilations in one rescuer CPR and a two-year-old? So all one rescuer CPR, whether it's adult, child, or infant is 30 to two. The only time it's 15 to two is would be if it's two-person infant or two-person child. So everything else is 30 to two. And again, none of that would mean anything if they're intubated because then it would be continuous compressions. 17, you're dispatched to a party not breathing. Upon arrival, you find a 72-year-old male patient on the floor in cardiac arrest. Patient states, um, family states the patient was last seen eight hours ago. The family presents you with a properly completed New York State out of hospital DNR that was signed in 2002. You should. So this goes back to, I guess, our first class that we had last week, which is DNRs never expire, okay? Uh, they can be rescinded, but they never expire, okay? So this patient has a properly completed DNR and they're in cardiac arrest, which means you do not do anything. Okay, so the answer would be do not start resuscitation. Now, if the family says to you, please, please, please do something, you could say to them, listen, you know, your, your loved one filled out a legal document saying they don't want us to do anything. So we're obligated to follow that legal document. You know, we can't do anything. Um, if they don't fall for that and they're really pressuring you and you feel there may result in a confrontation, then you could start resuscitating them. Uh, usually what I would do is call medical control and say, can you, ration, you know, can you discuss this with these people and explain to them? And they're usually very good about it saying, listen, the paramedics cannot start resuscitating because, you know, your family member had this filled out and, you know, more than likely at this point anyway, they have irreparable brain damage. So even if they were, you know, saved, they would be a vegetable in a nursing home and that's not what you want or they want. And they're usually good with that. Okay, so we're going to do... Um, 18. Which of the following advanced directives can be honored by EMTs in New York State? And it's EMTs and or paramedics in New York State. So we can, we have to, I shouldn't say could be, but we, sh we, we have to honor a New York State uh, out of hospital DNR, okay? And we have to honor a medical order for life-sustaining treatment most form. I don't see a lot of most forms in Rockland County. There's one nursing home that uses them, but it's basically a DNR on steroids. This just basically says, you know, if the patient is not breathing or does not have a pulse, do not start CPR. That's the top one. This one has that in there, but it goes into like nutrition and hydration and uh, CPAP and BiPAP and oxygen. It goes into many more things besides CPR. Um, we are not allowed to honor a living will or a healthcare proxy because that requires a physician to determine that the patient is not able to make decisions for themselves. So obviously if a patient is in cardiac arrest, they can't make decisions for themselves, but because the law says that patient has to be evaluated by a physician. That's why we can't honor those. So you could tell the family that we have to, you know, start CPR, transport them to the hospital. Personally, I wouldn't work them up ALS. 
you know, if the family just wants it to be called and you can't call it because it's not the right document, um, I would call medical control, tell them, you know, we're just going to do CPR and transport the patient. And then when the, tell the family, when the patient gets to the hospital, you know, the emergency room will uh, pronounce the patient. If you've spoken with the emergency room and that's what they say they're going to do. It's what's called clear and convincing evidence. Uh, a living will and a uh, healthcare proxy are considered clear and convincing evidence of the patient's wishes. And obviously, if it's a healthcare proxy, the person who's the proxy has to come along and tell the hospital that they don't want anything to be done. You're transporting a patient home from the hospital has an in-hospital DNR. So an in-hospital DNR is what's given in an Article 20 facility like a hospital, and it covers the patient while they're in the hospital and for the ride home from the hospital. Okay, so we're transporting a patient from the hospital who has an in-hospital DNR. No out-of-hospital DNR has been issued. That's what we usually come across. While in the ambulance, the patient goes into cardiac arrest. So since the in-hospital DNR covers them for a ride home, they're covered by a DNR. So we would basically have to withhold resuscitation, A, and transport the deceased patient back to the hospital for pronouncement, okay? Now, don't be surprised, and this would be a nursing home. Let's say you're taking a patient home from a nursing home to, because they're a resident of your area and you're doing, you know, you're being nice people and you're taking them home. Um, if that patient were to code, okay, and they had an in-hospital DNR, that would cover them for the ride home. That case, you would take them back to the nursing home. So good luck with that. You know, they're going to be like, nope, <laughs> we gave their bed away. You know, you're not going to, you know, we're not going to take them back. But legally, they have to take them back. And the same thing like the hospital, they have to take them back. Obviously, you're not going to be pulling in lights and sirens. I would just pull up, um, you know, up in front and send one person in you know, and explain what happened. You're probably gonna have to find a charge nurse and this person and that person, um, you know, to, uh, to explain to them what happened and that they're, you know, they're supposed to take the patient back, but they should know that. Okay, you respond to an unconscious patient who you find to be pulseless and apneic. While examining the patient, you find a purple discolorization in the small of the patient's back and the back of their thighs. You should. So what is that called? So you have a person who's dead, right? and the blood is not circulated. And it begins, the blood begins to pool on what they call the dependent parts of the body, which are closest to the ground. And that's called dependent lividity. That means the patient has been dead in excess of 15 to 20 minutes, which means really resuscitation at that point is useless, right? Because they have irreparable brain damage at that point. And it's, they've probably been down even more than that. So the right answer would be to withhold resuscitation. That is a dead body. And, you know, you're going to call the medical examiner. You have the cops call the medical examiner, put a sheet over them. There's nothing really to do for that patient. Um, you respond to a motorcycle accident, cycle into the boulder. 18-year-old rider was thrown from his bike. Helmet is cracked off his head. Patient has significant blunt trauma to the head and thorax. You cannot find a pulse. Based on the assessment, you determine that resuscitation should be withheld. Is that correct? So the right answer is yes. It's a traumatic cardiac arrest, pulseless, with you know, non-survivable injuries, um, you don't really have to work that. <sighs> Sometimes, like, you know, if this is like 20 guys riding motorcycles and they're all standing around expecting you to do something, or it's in public view and the cops are kind of asking you to do something, uh, we may just do it just for that reason. But from a medical standpoint, that would be a patient that's not workable. They have a, you know, fatal injury. Um, survival of, of traumatic cardiac arrest is pretty much zero anyway and these, this person has significant injuries. So the answer in the test would be true that um, you're not gonna work the patient. Okay, but real life, things may be you know, a little different. Okay, New York State EMT is gonna make a pronouncement of death. The only people who could pronounce death in New York State are licensed physicians and licensed um, nurse practitioners can sign death certificates. I don't think even PAs can sign death certificates. I think the doctor actually has to sign it. So we cannot pronounce death. We can decide not to resuscitate, but the cops always ask us, what time are you pronouncing them dead? And you just, I always say to them, we are not, we legally do not pronounce death. That requires a doctor, but I could tell you that at, you know, whatever, 1732, you know, we're going to decide not to resuscitate that patient if you want a time, okay? Uh, and same thing, paramedics cannot make a pronouncement of death. Now, you know, Wayne, Pete, some guys that have been around for a long time. You remember Dr. Zugerby, who was the medical examiner. Dr. Zugerby put out a checklist that he gave to EMTs along with a mirror. And he said that you could fill out that checklist and if everything was no, you could pronounce that patient death and write a time down there. It was probably not legal. The mirror was actually, as you were supposed to put it in front of the patient's mouth and nose and see if it fogged up, that the patient was still breathing. 
So it, it's it's not it was never valid probably back then, and it's you know not valid now. But you're talking Rockland County, you know, 25 years ago, and whatever it's not wasn't as cutting edge as it is today if you consider it cutting edge. So uh, we cannot pronounce death. We can decide not to resuscitate, but we cannot pronounce death. That requires a physician. Dependent lividity it tends to occur before rigor mortis. That is true, right? So the first thing that you see when somebody has been dead in excess of 15 to 20 minutes would be dependent lividity. And then depending on the temperature of the room and the temperature of the body, rigor mortis would start setting in somewhere from an hour on where you know, you'd start seeing the muscles getting rigid. And the next question says, what's the first part of the body that displays that rigor mortis? And that is the jaw, so that would also be correct. They either die with their uh, mouth open and you can't close it, or their mouth is closed and you can't open it. So again, you walk in on an unattended death, right? The family says, we just came home, found our father lying on the floor, okay? Before you start CPR, you should roll that patient, okay? Look at their back and see if there is any purplish discolorization in the small of their back. And if there is, you just, you know, politely say, I'm sorry, he's been down for a long period of time. There's nothing we could do, okay? If that's not there, you know, I would still look for rigor mortis, but uh, usually dependent lividity is the first sign you see, okay? And if they have either dependent lividity, rigor mortis, or a mortal injury, okay, then they're not workable. So you don't have to work them. Okay, and then out of hospital DNRs never expire, and that answer is true. Okay, so I'm going to unmute everyone. Does anybody have any questions on anything before we uh, call it night? Everybody good? Hi, yes. Frank. Okay, hi, you guys. I see Joan Marie and Lara sitting in the dark now. Was that wine that you guys were drinking? She was saying that she, originally she was saying in Westchester it got too expensive. It was Westchester too expensive. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody's talking. But anyway, does anybody have any questions on um, anything before we uh, before we um, end it for the night? Okay. Okay. So everybody have a good night. Be safe. Okay. Thank Remember, you, Frank. We're probably gonna have. Second wave of COVID, so if you, uh, you guys should be conserving your PPE because she the was. county and the state does not have any more PPE to um, give us. Okay, but um, she feels you know better. we're probably going to have a second <laughs> wave and stuff like that. Okay, so everybody have a good night, and uh, I guess we'll reconvene in a month or so, and I'll send out the test in a couple of minutes. Okay. Good night. Take care. Thanks, Frank. Take she care. Good night, everyone. Yeah, I'm wondering whose life story we're hearing here. Is that Marielle? I don't know. Okay, take care. Bye.